This is a tribute to Winston Churchill and also to my father, Harry Chrysostomus, who fought four years in World War II, making this recording in Jerusalem on November 2013, 5,773. David Ben-Gurion's comments on Winston Churchill. How can Churchill be described in ordinary terms? He was unique. Not only was he the greatest leader Britain ever produced, but he was certainly among the greatest statesmen of all time. And who in history can match his varied adventures, the facets to his character, his many-sided talents? What he did in 1940 was a rare feat in history. He lifted an entire nation out of the depths of humiliation and defeat, instilled in them the spiritual strength to hold fast against heavy odds, and eventually roused them to efforts which ensured victory. He did this in a democracy, where his basic weapon to get a united nation behind him was his own power of persuasion. He was able to do so by his unique combination of qualities. Magnetic leadership, powerful eloquence, contagious courage, supreme self-confidence, a deep sense of history, and an unshakable faith in the destiny of his people. His shoulders were broad enough to bear the heaviest possible responsibilities, and there was nothing dilatory about his decision-making. I am sure, Ben-Gurion says, he welcomed the power when it came, because I am sure he knew he was the only man at the time who could save Britain. And he did. I know the age-old discussion about whether the man produces the hour or the hour the man. I think it is quite on the cards that if not for Churchill, England would have gone down with all the implications for the world if that had happened. History would have been quite different if there had been no Churchill. One of the interesting things reflecting on democracy and on this man who welded a power so cheerfully and so easily is that if he had not been given power in 1940, he would not have seized it. And it was touch and go whether he would have be given it. Though by nature a rebel, pugnacious and adventurous, he was yet an absolute stickler for constitutional forms. Born and brought up in the greatest democratic society in the world, his reverence for parliamentary institutions was unshakable. Throughout the 1930s, though he knew that in sheer ability he was head and shoulders above anyone else in his party, he was rigidly excluded from office and took no steps to secure office. He knew that his own party colleagues, who were the government of the day, were, were running the country to ruin. He spoke out against their lack of preparedness, called attention to the dangers of Hitler, but he saw himself powerless to stop the inevitable doom. When war came, he was reluctantly admitted into the cabinet and he quickly showed his mettle. But when the catastrophe struck in 1940, his party was still reluctant to give him a top job even though they knew that Chamberlain had to go. Chamberlain and his principal colleagues wanted Halifax. Churchill knew well the history of the Jews, both in their own land and in the diaspora. And he had a tremendous admiration for their tenacity and extraordinary capacity for survival, despite the long and cruel persecutions they had suffered. Thousands of years had not changed their character, nor eased their sufferings, nor destroyed their spirit. The Jews remained alive in spite of everything the world had done to them, and despite all they had done to themselves. 
with their internal dissensions. This and their spiritual greatness prompted the parallel in Churchill's mind between them and the Greeks. Both had left mankind a legacy of wisdom and genius. Athens and Jerusalem are the most precious cities in the history of the Western civilization. <laughs>